she is an expert in chemtrails, weather control, synthetic biology. She's the preeminent researcher in this of what's happening in your skies that affect you on a biological or synthetic level. This is very cutting edge stuff. The dark agenda of synthetic biology. Please, I won't waste any more time. Welcome the very wonderful Sia for Sophia Smallstorm. Thank you. I'll, this actually is an hour or so, this presentation. We might not have time for questions, but you can ask me at the banquet or you can come to my table tomorrow and ask me as many questions as you like, which I probably won't be able to answer. So the thing about um, what's going on now is how big is the big picture? And I used to think that uh, if you went outside the box, you could see more. And a lot of people believe that this settles at the level of power and control. That if they have all the power, they have all the control, that's what they want. There's actually something beyond that. And that's what I've started to explore. The big picture, I may be wrong, but I want you to follow the dots that I connect, which are basically in the form of a square. I'll start here, I'll go here, I'll go here, I'll go there, and a shape will be made. The terrain is huge. It's much, much bigger than I ever dreamed of. And so it's about really impressions and perspective. And I had a friend who's now no longer alive, Harriet. Harriet used to keep me awake at night on the phone and tell me things until 1 o'clock in the morning, notes that she had taken from listening to radio shows. She really taught me how to see. So. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. Now here is a photograph, and here is an impression. So I am going to give you the impressions that I have gathered and see what you think of them by the end of this evening. We're getting new impressions of the sky. Once upon a time, clouds used to be puffy like this. Today, you see a lot of streaks, feathers, and unnatural crisscross configurations. When you look closely at what forms your impression, you can see that this is the impression version, you will see streaks, feathers, more feathers, lines. When you look closely at the lines, you see this. Looking at a collage of lines, with what appears to be a plane. You see ropes in the sky made by planes. Forming a web, a haze. The formation of man-made clouds is admitted to by NASA. They call it jet cirrus. We're told that new atmospheric condi conditions are causing jet contrails to linger in the sky. But anything that stays in the sky for many hours fans out, as you see here, and forms a layer of material thick enough to block sunlight for miles is not condensation. The con in contrail is for condensation. So if it isn't condensation, meaning water droplets that under normal circumstances quickly evaporate, then what is it? Here's the result of one, it was a huge donut. This is Cardiff State Beach, where I live, and it literally formed a big oval, a halo in the sky. Contrails typically form behind high-flying jets, so that's high altitude, in low humidity. Clouds typically form at low altitude 
in higher humidity. So the rule is this, clouds and contrails need opposite conditions to form. But today, we have vapor trails, as they call them, condensation trails turning into clouds and spreading out to form a low altitude white haze. In many parts of the world, we're losing our blue sky. You see New Mexico in the past and New Mexico in the present. The word for this, uh, many people call it whiteout. If you travel in a plane, this is what you're going to see from the window. There's a demarcation line where the white arrow is. I call it the spray line, below which the world is seen through a veil and above which you have that true deep blue sky. We live in the veil. We live in a white world of whatever it is that's descending on us from above. Our visibility is impaired. The sky as we look up at it is now a much lighter blue. But the change has been so incremental that most of us are too busy to have noticed. When you look at airborne environmental samples and the soil and water samples that people have c collected throughout the country, you get three types of materials. Metallic salts, filaments or fibers, and engineered biologicals. Metallic salts are oxides. Aluminum, titanium, barium are three examples. And it appears now that the air around us has been filled with these metallic oxides, which are conductive, conductive particles. So the air is no longer neutral. Air is supposed to be neutral to support life. It is not supposed to be charged. The air around us is also filled with fibers. And if you get a black light, apparently you can buy them at Home Depot, you can see All right, how do you make clouds and rain? Clouds are formed from moisture that evaporates from the Earth's surface, carried upward on air that's warmed by the sun. As the warm air rises, it begins to cool. There's a certain point, they call it the dew point, D-E-W. And at that point, the moisture in the air begins to condense around particulates which are in the air. And these particulates are usually dust or salt. These particulates are called condensation nuclei. They have an affinity for moisture, dust, salt, like water, okay? As more water vapor gathers around the particulates, the combination becomes unstable, which is a raindrop. So we know that particulates in the atmosphere nucleate, meaning they gather into raindrops. Now here is something interesting. Daniel Rosenfeld, he's an atmospheric scientist, Hebrew University, Jerusalem. He claims that pollution particulates actually prevent rain by forming very tiny, very stable droplets that remain suspended and do not fall earthward. Now this was um, headlines. You can Google, pollution stops rain. If this is correct, then it suggests that the smaller the particulate, the more stable the droplet. So this is how you would get clouds to hang in the sky as haze, or so-called clouds. And so it would seem that you could create cloud-like masses simply by releasing small enough particulates into the atmosphere. And those clouds would not fall. They would spread outward instead to form haze. Which leads us to the subject of geoengineering defined as the large-scale manipulation of the Earth's environment to suit human needs and promote habitability. Last year, scientists began to discuss something called SAG, Stratospheric Aerosol Geoengineering, which was supposedly spraying soot and sulfates in the atmosphere to form a shield against the heat of the sun. This presumes the notion of man-made warming, the idea being that atmospheric science can rescue us from climate change, which is nature's retaliation against us for creating global warming. 
For now, we're told that this is a future consideration, but for years, we've already been seeing strange clouds and hazy skies. What exactly is dripping here? This is a photo I took, Cardiff, California, and I call these the bearded clouds. And here you have this new form, they tell us, new form of cloud, a hooked cloud called cirrus uncinus. And here you have asperatus. This is like the canopy effect, blanket. This is another picture I took. I had never seen this kind of cloud before. I'd only seen photos of it, and then it suddenly appeared. The presence of strange clouds, persistent haze, and impaired visibility is not just in the air and sky. It must be having an effect on the ground, on the Earth's soil and water. Francis Mangles is a retired federal wildlife biologist and botanist from Mount Shasta. And he notes that between the 1950s and 60s, jets did not leave many contrails. Today, what appear to be jet contrails are much more frequent and last for 10 to 20 hours. And here's what they look like over these beautiful mountains and lakes. Now, this would make a lovely uh, view, don't you think? Counting all trails in every direction over Mount Shasta, Mangle says, the FAA indicates there can't be that many flights per day. The number has been as high as over 30 contrails at once, and I've counted 100 just before weather fronts. Typically, heavy spraying days are just before weather fronts that come in from the Pacific. So here you have a photo of this man who is a retired federal wildlife biologist and a water specialist. Lab tests from Northern California show very high levels of aluminum and barium in soil and pond water. Francis Mangles told me that at 100 micrograms per liter, when he was working for the um, federal government, you were shut down, 100 micro, I'm sorry, 1,000 micrograms per liter. So I asked him what normal is, what's tolerable, and he said five-tenths. 0.5 micrograms per liter is considered normal. So here you have the findings from pond water in Mount Shasta. You can see 12,000 micrograms per liter. UG is short for microgram, which is 24,000 times normal. Snow drift at 8,000 feet, 61,100 micrograms per liter, way, way past normal. And here you have a lined pond. So please picture a lined pond, a pond with a liner, vinyl something, in Bella Vista. And you got a, a reading, or the person who did this, I know him, Dane Wigington, got a reading 375,000 micrograms per liter in this little pond. Mangles has, a ma I will repeat, a master's of science in water-related subjects. And he also reports that a house, um, the soil tested outside this house in Northern California was 3,000 times, 3,000 micrograms per, of aluminum more than the soil under the house. I'm sorry, I said 3,000 times. Anyway, so what does this mean? It means that something is dropping from above and is affecting the soil around the house but not underneath it. So you can't say that this is in the groundwater. You can't say this is in the earth itself coming from the earth. It's got to be coming from the environment. The dying of the trees. I've spoken to Charles Little. He's the author of this absolutely fantastic book, which you can buy still by um, going to half.com or Amazon used books. It is about the natural or biotic reasons for tree death, and also the effects of industry and deforestation, which began decades ago, when manufacturing exploded, acid rain, different forms of pollution started to affect trees. But what has come along since this book was written is this. Nowadays, we have an effect coming out of the environment that can't possibly be natural. Look at this corkscrew. I took this picture myself. This is the wine opener style. You have nature trying to cope with the introduction of new substances, 
particularly metallic oxides, which are also the metallic salts. Living things, as I said before, um, the metallic salts have an affinity for water, so living things take up these salts along with the water that they're seeking. The natural world, which gets its food from the ground, is sucking this stuff up. This is a scraggly pine tree outside the post office in Cardiff, California, where I go every day. And you can see how brittle it is, lots of needles lost. If you look closely at the needles when you stand under the tree, you see that they're all frosted with brown. Signs of tree death are these sagging limbs, these leafless, scraggly branches. You also see infestation by bugs, insects, mites, fungus. These are spider mites that have taken up in a tree that was right next to my house. The entire tree had to be felled because of these white webs in it that were killing off the tree. But again, I'll explain why in a minute. This isn't the primary source of the death. Here you have a phenomenon that Deborah Whitman, who's here with us today, has done a lot of research on. Um, the white, we call it the tube sock effect on trees. You see white bark. And when we tested the bark of this tree, it showed it had these readings, aluminum 387. Now this is milligrams per kilogram because this is a mass analysis rather than a liquid um, uh, liquid context. So you have barium at 18.4, strontium 113, and titanium 15.2. You can see again in these uh, photos the enormous scorched look. That's a very dying, very unhealthy tree. And you see this other thing called secondary growth. The tufts on the trunk poking out, that's the tree giving itself desperately trying to give itself a second stab at life. So when you look around you and you see these little growths, sometimes they're all the way along the trunk from the ground up. The beauty of an induced problem is that its twin is the solution. As nature begins to die, we will be told that science will have to step in to save it. So, You'll have GMO trees as the answer. The silent forest, they call it, genetically engineered trees, non-reproductive, no fruit, nuts, blossoms, no insects, animals, birds, low lignin, that's the wood um, fiber, which makes the tree very easy to cut and pulp. The silent forest will grow straight and tall and will be replenished by the state in what will be considered appropriate numbers and in appropriate locations. In May 2010, from this article, we learned that the USDA approved large-scale field trials of 200,000 GMO eucalyptus trees made by ArborGen, a biotech company, to be planted from Florida to Texas. Now, we're told that the purpose of the trial planting is to evaluate whether such GM trees can become new sources of wood for paper and biofuels, also in the name of conservation and improvement. This is the story they give us. We're trying to conserve, we're trying to go green, we're trying to help. But then you come in, up against articles like this, 2008. This was from something called the MIT Technology Review an article announcing biochemistry's development of toxicity-resistant crops. In particular, in this article, aluminum-resistant um, plants. So the article tells us that aluminum in soil stunts the growth of crops. Wheat, corn, and barley don't fare well in aluminum-laden soils. But now, scientists, plant scientists, have found a way to get the plant to shut down its own cell division to, sorry, to stop the plant from shutting down its own cell division. Because when a plant encounters toxins in the soil, it says to itself, I don't want to keep growing. So it shuts down the cell division. But they have figured out a way to keep prompting those plants to produce um, reproduction. So this is a gene mutation, a single gene mutation, that inactivates a protein so that the plant continues to grow. 
The quote from this article is very interesting. The plant is effectively blind to what's happening in the cell. And that's from biochemist Paul Larson. The mutant plants can maintain high levels of growth in the presence of toxic levels of aluminum, even if they sustain DNA damage. When something begins to die in nature, it attracts bugs, blight, molds, even viruses and bacteria. This is nature's way of hastening decomposition so that the dying form can become food for other living things. Today, we have an epidemic of tree decline all over the world, not just in America, but it's in Australia, it's in Europe. Thousands of square miles of die-off in the savannas and forests of many, many continents. And in cities and suburbs, trees are rotting as they stand, swooning, breaking. They are hazards to property requiring removal. Six trees around my house have been taken out in the last two years. Sunlight is a natural disinfectant. As hazy skies limit the sunlight, molds and fungus grow. As plants that are taking up toxins struggle to live, molds, viruses, bacteria begin to take them over. This is all part of nature, and bioremediation will be the obvious answer. Metallic salts have made our air conductive. This means that we and everything around us can transmit and propagate energy. The air is no longer neutral. It no longer supports in a healthy way living things. The second group of materials found in these environmental samples is unidentifiable fibers. And I really want you to appreciate the meaning of unidentifiable. These fibers have been sent to sophisticated laboratories and there is nothing, nothing in the databases that match them. So these are fibers, we could say, that do not exist in nature. People around the world are developing lesions on their skin that ooze and produce fibers. This is known as Morgellons syndrome. Tissue samples cultured from ordinary people without this ailment contain and grow the very same fibers. Here's a five-inch lesion on a woman's body that has never healed, five inches. The fibers or filaments are actually tubules with hollow insides. When these fibers are cultured, they produce colonies of filaments. You can see the extension filaments. And these colonies continue to grow and reproduce, branching out into more filaments and more colonies. The filament cultures can be grown from saliva samples, tissue from the skin, mucus, urine, blood. From animals and people, regardless of the presence of the Morgellons condition. The fibers are segmented with visible structures inside them. So where do these fibers or filaments come from? Airborne environmental samples that were collected by Clifford Carnicom, he is a researcher in this subject, in 2000, the year 2000, gathered at high altitude on a mountain in New Mexico showed the presence of those fibers whose structure matches exactly the tubular filaments. When I say fibers and filaments, basically interchangeable, showing up in our blood, tissues, and skin. Additionally, the samples collected by Mr. Carnicum showed what he calls, and was called in biology, desiccated erythrocytes. This is a multisyllabic term, but it means dried red blood cells. So, why these were in the air. Why are dried red blood cells in the air? Very puzzling. A medical microscopist, a biologist um, specializing in microscopy, confirmed to him that they were human red blood cells, but that they had been engineered in some way so as to be preserved. So again, you have to ask yourself, if I were five years old, I would say, Mommy, what are red blood cells doing falling out of the sky? Biology divides life into three kingdoms, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Bacteria and archaea are simple organisms 
with no subcellular compartments. Eukarya are complex with defined cell compartments and internal organelles, mini organs like mitochondria that make DNA and energy for the cell. Plants, animals, and humans are eukaryotic, as are fungi and slime molds. The archaea are the hardiest of the life forms. They're able to withstand grinding pressure, heat, acidity, and alkalinity. They can live in volcanoes, geysers, and the ice shelf. Bacteria, on the other hand, will die in extreme heat and cold, which is why we cook and freeze our food. Now, the materials appearing within these filaments are as tough as archaea. They look like bacteria and they self-replicate. One looks like something called mycoplasma, but is not. One looks like chlamydia, but is not. And natural fibers or filaments would be classified as fungal in the domain of eukaryotes. But these fibers contain forms from the other two groups inside them. You're looking at a tubular fiber with self-replicating internal elements resembling bacteria and behaving like archaea. That does not happen in the natural world. So what are they? What's going on? It appears that within our bodies we now have all three life kingdoms replicating themselves. What does that make us? Are we still eukaryotes or are we becoming something else? You could call this transbiology, a crossing of biology, the creation of hybrid forms. Materials are forming in our bodies that are not native to us, not natural, and entirely new. You can see in these pictures the tubular filaments with the branches. They're branching off. That's their self-replication. They're creating new colonies. And you can also see in the bottom picture a little bud. That's the beginning of a new fiber. The territory of things on the scale of atoms and molecules is the nano world. Science has opened up the nano universe where incredible new creations are possible. Nanotechnology explores materials that are less than a micron in size or from 1 to 100 nanometers. And a nanometer is a billionth, one billionth of a meter. Nature and biology continually, continually work on the nanoscale, assembling proteins and building with crystals to conduct the business of life. Spider webs are an example of that. Very fine filaments with enormous strength and flexibility because they contain nanoscale crystals. So let's go back to the filaments and the structures they contain, these ones that Clifford Carnicom has found. In those unidentifiable filaments, he has observed the formation of red blood cells and submicron-sized structures. So now you've got a filament making its own red blood cells. The engineered cells, the red blood, very, very tough, withstanding excesses of heat and chemicals, indicating that they are designed to endure almost anything. He has put them in a Bunsen flame, he has poured bleach on them, acid, and they still endure. In addition, they are able to replicate, growing outside of the body in a Petri dish. This is highly sophisticated technology, going on by itself, not in a laboratory. So we are having, we're witnessing red blood growing outside, having nothing to do with the bone marrow, in a Petri dish, in somebody's um, very uh, low-level lab. Could it be that artificial materials are being introduced into living things? Here you have, this comes from the nanotech industry. It's what I call the nanotech pyramid. You start with materials, you go up to structures, processes, and devices. Could it be that artificial materials are being introduced into us to create new processes from the ground up? Which processes will override our own natural biology, our own internal systems? People with advanced Morgellon syndrome started with fibers coming out of their skin, and they're now observing very strange crystalline forms and metallic devices. 
the fibers became multicolored and now they were accompanied by plaques strange hard little almost like shards people say they're like glass and they're colored the lesions keep emitting these things they don't heal over or close sometimes for years here are more plaque structures even grooved metallic devices on the right you'll see one device the front and the back these images are supplied by Jan Smith of MargellansExposed.com who has done extensive research on biotech websites looking for things that match what comes out of her body and she's finding them the fibers from her skin were from high-density polyethylene and I'm going to read what she's written on her website. The bizarre nature of my findings suggest a man-made source. It occurred to me that if these pathogens were being bioengineered in a lab, they were made of multiple components. The mutated material might reproduce and intermittently send out a batch of identifiable debris, much like the original genetics. I call this type of debris throwbacks. It's her theory that when new life forms are made through this gene splicing and mutation, bioengineering and nanotechnology, they will self-replicate in all kinds of ways, creating different mutations in each generation. Morgellon specimens can sometimes be identified with the original spores before those mutations occurred. Jan found three varieties of something called Omycota fungus in her specimens, as well as something else called Dictyostelium discoidium, which is a slime mold that is a major player in biomedical research today. The material coming from her body was ribbony and motile. It was grooved and oval, very much like the Omycota spore you see here. At the bottom, where the purple arrow from the uh, bottom is a, it's a diagram of Omycota. And on the upper right, you see something that came out of Jan's body that looks exactly like Omycota. The fiber strands that you see here were made of cellulose and GNA. GNA is glucans polysaccharide sugars, and this was confirmed by microscopy. GNA is a synthetic cousin of DNA. It has a three-carbon glycerol sugar in it instead of the five-carbon um, that you find in DNA. Here's a news report from April 2008 in which we are told, big headlines, GNA is DNA's chemical cousin. It's a nanotechnology building block. The Biodesign Institute at Arizona State develops the first self-assembled nanostructures composed entirely of GNA, synthetic analog of DNA. The nanostructures contain additional properties not found in DNA, including the ability to form mirror image structures. An NIH article from Japan on research from Japan also tells us that various conductive polymers and gold nanoparticles are entrapped within the helical super superstructure of this GNA. Now, the uh, particular sugar found in this GNA is called beta-1,3 glucans. And here you see it under what's called a Raman spectroscope, very sophisticated equipment. It looks, um, the microscopist who looked at this called it a sugar snake. So this is the GNA that you're looking at. When Jan's fibers were put to a high heat flame, they re released what she calls a gold payload. So they dropped out this tiny little bead of gold. And here's more, the fibers that contain a head, she calls it a golden head, orbs and they all have this payload in them. Uh, here you have a nano array that she found, a couple of them in her body. Nano array is a tiny device used in biotech for DNA hybridization. And on the left you see a diagram from an industry website of a nano array and on on the slide you can see actually two of them. She's marked them with red X's that came out of her body looking exactly like this. And again, I'll say it again, the nanoarrays are these tiny devices that are used for DNA hybridization. So, I'm going to repeat my nanotech pyramid. We begin with the emergence of basic filaments, followed by more complex structures. 
So what processes are going on here? Are these materials combining to form devices that are working together inside us? What is happening to our biology? And remember that tissue samples obtained from ordinary people who have no Morgellons symptoms, no lesions, can be cultured to produce the very same filaments found in people with Morgellons. So we would have to conclude that Morgellons is like the canary in the coal mine and that only some people are exuding the materials. And could that be because their bodies are rejecting it while our bodies are integrating it? Jan's body has been sending out these plaques, colored plaques, which are hard pieces of silica. Some of them have these dots on them. They're very small. They require handling with a needle as she places them under a microscope. The plaques are fragile. They can shatter. Quantum dots, which are oops, the colors you see, are nanocrystal semiconductors made of heavy metals surrounded by an organic shell. Now, I want you to remember some of these terms. Heavy metals, okay? Heavy metals, aluminum and so forth. So these are nanocrystal semiconductors surrounded by an organic shell, but they are made of heavy metals. And Morgellon subjects are also finding this stuff. Jewel-like hexagons, faceted pyramids, crystals. Hexagons have shown up environmentally, not only in tissues, but they are in environmental fallout. This specimen is provided by Morgellons Research Group, and we have a table here this weekend, Mike and Jennifer from Morgellons Research Group. Here is a pink, ruby-colored pink layered crystal. The little inset image, you can see actually the layers in it. This was an environmental crystal found. Here is something that was not visible to the naked eye, but the woman um, who told me about it and sent me the photo was looking at hay. She lives in Oregon, and she was looking at a piece of hay under her microscope, and she found this bright pink, teeny tiny little crystal. You get crystals with embedded hexagons, strands that glitter. The one on the right, that's a glittering strand that came out of somebody's body. Here's a picture of tissue from a lesion with several crystals. You can see the arrows attached to it. You can see the fiber coming out from the bottom. You have combinations of wires and those quantum dots. Now here are the nanotechnology dyes. And there you see the colored plaques that have been coming out of people's bodies. One on the below has fibers attached to it. The industry tells us that quantum dots are tiny nanocrystals whose small size gives them unprecedented tunability. Okay? Tunability. The piezoelectric effect is the internal generation of a voltage when an outside pressure is applied, and vice versa. You can Google the piezo effect. The piezo effect occurs in crystals, ceramics, DNA, and certain proteins. So an example is, when you put a frequency to a crystal, it generates a voltage. And when you put a voltage to a crystal, it responds with a frequency. We call this piezoelectricity. Electricity resulting from applied compression or frequency. Recent work by Clifford Carnicom reveals that a filament culture subjected to a blue light frequency, that's 375 nanometers, resulted in explosive growth of the culture within 24 hours after the initial incubation. So he put the blue light on, incubated it for five to seven days, and then it exploded into all those little fibers that you see. We now live in a frequency-filled world. I don't have time to address harp, artificial weather, and the enormous spread of unnatural frequencies that are affecting the Earth today. But I will say this. I came across a very well-known paper on electromagnetic fields and neurology, neurological function, written by Professor Ross Aidy, Loma Linda School of Medicine with the subtitle, A Possible Paradigm Shift in Biology. We learn that the Earth's 
own natural magnetic field peaks, that means peaks top, at 32 hertz. And that only happens in certain equatorial thunderstorms. The electronics we use today generate electromagnetic fields that are tremendous in the megahertz and gigahertz, million hertz and billion hertz range. So here you can see Earth and nature up at the top, 3 to 30 hertz. You can see HARP has a low range. Then you see the Gwen Towers, that's Ground Wave Emergency Network, the blue. HARP again has another range right after that. Gwen has another range after that. And look at the phones and internet. We're talking about million hertz and billion hertz. Professor Aidy reminds us that chemical bonds are magnetic bonds formed between atoms by paired electrons with opposite spins that are attracted magnetically. So if nature itself moves in the 3 to 30 hertz range, what is happening to us on the biochemical level with all the different frequencies our bodies are experiencing? What is being done to our biology? Again, I'll repeat Ross Aidy's little tenet here. Chemical bonds are magnetic bonds. Electromagnetism is capable of changing what is happening in our bodies. Frequencies are capable of supplying to the synthetic materials in our bodies the force or power that activates them, gets them working, makes them come alive. Nothing about us today is normal. We have hair that glows and skin that shimmers. This is from a healthy woman in Oregon who's been doing microscopy. And if you go to Mike and Jennifer's table, they can demonstrate some of this iridescent um, effect for you. Here is a glowing little arrow-shaped thing found in rainwater when the same woman who supplied the former um, images, previous images, was scanning. She was scanning water from a puddle under her microscope, and she saw this arrow-shaped thing that gl glowed. And here's a hexagon that grew a fiber in 20 seconds as it was being observed under the microscope. The field of synthetic biology is a new frontier of science. It draws from biochemistry and biomedicine, genetics, robotics, radiation biology, and information technologies. Using nanotechnology, its goals are to improve and transcend the limits of nature. On February 21st of this year, Time magazine had a feature story on the singularity, the term signifying the merging of man with machine. The story was released on Valentine's Day, February 14th, to underscore a love affair, the marriage of humanity and technology. The article tells us that a transformation is coming and our species, Homo sapien, will no longer be recognizable as itself. We will be something new, something better. The time predicted for this transformation is 2045. The man who is making this prediction is Ray Kurzweil, a futurist known for his uncanny accuracy in just this area the pace at which technology grows and improves, such that it will one day be smarter and better than us. That's the singularity. There's a singularity university hosted by NASA, sponsored by Google, to teach people about the intelligence explosion. Ray Kurzweil has made fortunes over and over as an engineer and inventor. A documentary about him is called The Transcendent Man. He wrote the best-selling book that you see here, The Singularity is Near, which came out in 2005. Singularity is a word from astrophysics referring to a point in space-time where the rules of ordinary physics no longer apply. Kurzweil has correctly predicted the growth of information technologies. He has made it clear to the world that technological progress is exponential, not linear, which means that advancement begins to advance itself in a manner of speaking. Exponential curves start slowly and then explode. A quote from the Time magazine article, in Kurzweil's future, biotechnology and nanotechnology give us the power to manipulate our bodies and the world around us at will, at the molecular level. 
we ditch Darwin and take charge of our own evolution. The question is, who is we and what is at will? Whose will? Kurzweil predicts that by 2020, we will have successfully reverse engineered the human brain. And when hyper-intelligent artificial intelligence arrives, all we have to do is hand ourselves off to it. Armed with advanced nanotechnology, AI will solve the problems of the world. Strong AI, they use this term, is a super powerful, broad spectrum intelligence that operates as easily and comfortably as a human being. It isn't just a chess playing computer. It's a machine intelligence that can pass for human in a blind test, which is as close as you can get to consciousness or sentience. Now, once this kind of intelligence is here, what will it do as a newly created inhabitant of the Earth? Would it compete with us for resources? More intelligent than we are, would it treat us as lesser beings? Would it recognize that we made it, or would it overrun us? Kurzweil is one of the world's leading transhumanists, number 30 on Time's most influential list. Transhumanists believe that we ourselves should merge with machines. Imagine a time when we can download our brains into a computer and upload a computer into our brains. The robotic blood cells will supposedly improve us and keep us healthy, as he says. But what if that's just the gloss to sell us on such bodily intrusions? Just as we're being sold on the idea of a smart environment, a techno matrix that will vibrate with not just intelligence but connection. What indeed is the World Wide Web? We may think it's the Internet but it will be the humming network of everything connected through ubiquitous intelligence, intelligence that is everywhere. Artificial intelligence will connect the world. Homo sapien will be transformed into homo evolutis. Biological processes will be run by technology. Living things will not be reproductive. The earth will be populated with engineered species and all processes will be patented, licensed and controlled. You could consider nanotechnology the installation of artificial intelligence in living and non-living things. Smart dust and smart moats, for instance, are tiny nanosensors that can float and land anywhere. As Kurzweil declares, self-replicating nanotechnology will infuse everything around us with itself. You have seen Today, the deposition and active presence of artificial materials in the sky, environment, and in living things. Nanotechnology has arrived at our personal doorstep without our permission. It isn't that this will happen in 2045. It's already here. Human enhancement is being sold to us as leaping tall buildings in a single bound and having better, fa faster, higher intelligence, perfect health. But all of that is the sales pitch. Enhancement may in fact be degradation, our being devolved to someone else's specifications. While nanobiotechnology promises in headlines to make our world better, it may in fact be busy taking us over so it can tailor us to the plan for the hive. Already transhumanists are looking forward to the creation of the post-human. An improved human that will have no gender, will not reproduce, will be a better performer in the workplace, will not be distracted by love or lust, will be free of disease thanks to these nanobots keeping it healthy. But all this is part of the fantasy. In reality, thanks to stressors on our physiology, infertility is soaring. Our sexuality is diversifying and the nuclear family is falling apart. Biotech is an exploding frontier. It is clever enough and small enough to enter and change our very cells. New forms of DNA have been invented. There is GNA, as I told you about, and PNA, a hybrid of protein and DNA, that will add to our double helix a third strand. When nanobiotech has a firm footing in us, it will be easy to upgrade and downgrade anyone and anything in any way. 
Oliver Curry, an evolutionist at the London School of Economics, predicted in 2007, the human race will one day split into two separate species, an attractive, intelligent, ruling elite, and an underclass of dim-witted, ugly, goblin-like creatures. So here you have the e-workers and the elites. Transhumans will presumably be involved in this process, the process of transformation, the process of renovation, remaking us into what someone considers improved. We are transhumans now. Improved is only what fits certain specifications. For instance, a specimen that can work 18 hours a day, a specimen that is sterile, that will never have the responsibility of caring for others, a specimen that is even-tempered with a narrow, predictable, predictable range of expression. All this is enhanced, improved. Better performance is just that, the ability to produce a better result. It does not mean a specimen with greater skills. It may mean a specimen with narrower skills and the ability to repeat a task. So while the current ethical debate is about whether or not we should upload computers into our brains and how human we will be when that happens, there is something happening on the nanoscale right now. What it is exactly is unknown to us. As attempts by lay people to communicate with scientists about Morgellons type materials are going nowhere. There is a blackout on this subject. Its victims are dismissed as having a psychological problem that is called delusional parasitosis. The presence of patented creations in our bodies gives rise to intellectual property issues. We know what has been done to small farmers into whose fields the winds have brought genetically engineered strains. They are sued by the powerful agricultural companies who own the patents. Will the day come when we are subjected to the jurisdiction of corporations whose patented materials we are carrying in our bodies? It doesn't matter how it got there. The fault is yours if it is simply in your possession. This is a forced partnership between us and them. This is how we will be eternally owned by them. This is how they can push our biology from Homo sapien to Homo evolutus without our having a say in it. For now, engineered technology in all living things is a secret. But one day we may be charged with unlawful possession of something that has become a part of us that we cannot get rid of. The nature of biology is to adapt. As more unnatural elements enter our bodies, if we cannot reject them, we will find ways to accommodate them. You could call it invasion of the body snatchers meet sleeping with the enemy. In fact, the original Body Snatchers movie contains some interesting lines. Your new bodies are taking you over, cell for cell, atom for atom, and you'll be born into an untroubled world. Don't fight it, Miles. It's no use. Their bodies were now hosts harboring an alien form of life, a cosmic form. Metabiology was a term coined by the famous Jonas Salk of the Salk polio vaccine. It describes a form of biological prospecting, exploiting genetics, using chemistry, physics, and radiation for commercial and other goals. The 1940s and 50s gave us the birth of radiation biology, the techniques of which were used to decipher the mysteries of heredity, genes, and immunity. Geneticists plumbed chemistry and physics using x-rays and UV light to irradiate plants, fungi, and fruit flies to see how mutations altered amino acids and enzymes to form a new biochemistry. All this continues today. We are living, walking laboratories for powerful science in a society of increasing control. We are being altered. The future being spoken of is happening now. My question is, how will we transcend this? I'm waiting. (laughs) 
Uh, what do you think, folks? Sophia Smallstorm, pretty amazing research. Very important. Thank you, Sophia.